Hey, everybody, this is Brant. Anybody out there? Going to check my comment section. Let's see, who do we got here? Dennis, good morning, Bob. Good morning. How is everybody? Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, maybe we'll give it a couple minutes here to let some other people filter in and change something on live chat here. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Good. Somehow I'm getting the wrong messages. I'm just getting top and not all. Yeah, it does look like a bull flag on that chart, doesn't it? So I'm going to take my ugly mug off of the screen here, and we'll take a look at that. So yeah, S&P 500, just basically a small pullback for the week. Just a little bit over 1%. Do you remember, you know, what happened? Sorry, I'm still fighting with this, <laughs> this little chat screen. Okay. So do you remember what happened last weekend? We we're talking about the um, the S and P five hundred meeting. It's measured move at forty one fifty. It exceeded that by a little bit. Almost hit two thousand. I think it missed that, or almost hit forty two hundred. It missed that by like two tenths of a percent or a tenth of a percent. Very very small. And then we had the uh, Nasdaq one hundred, and it was the last one, the only one that hadn't hit the measured move there at twelve seven eighty five, which happened last Thursday. And I always tell this to my subscribers is that the most likely outcome after a measured move is hit is, you know, price may go a little bit above it like we saw here, but it will generally come back down and either correct or consolidate. This is more of a consolidation in my view than a, a correction, but that's the highest probability. And that's pretty much what we've seen all week. So whether we're looking at the NASDAQ 100 here, or like you said, the bull flag in the S&P. Hi, Tony. How you doing? I'm probably uh, a little bit ahead of you guys on the chat here. So there's probably a little delay. Loud and clear. Cool. Thanks, JD. JMD email. So anyway, yeah, most likely scenario is a pullback. That's exactly what we have. And there's really nothing on these charts that are giving me pause for concern. Um, I would like to see some of the tactical signals that I use start to improve a little bit over in here. But right now, I think what is happening is the day after we hit all these measured moves, which was last, not this past Thursday, the Thursday before, uh, right over here, the very next day after we got that really strong payrolls report and we got the strong ISM services uh, PMI or it's called non-manufacturing, but it's services. We already know manufacturing is in a recession, but services is like 70% of the economy. So both those came in hot. So that just kind of played into this whole market correction pullback thing. And what I think is happening, quite frankly, is that the market is waiting until Tuesday for the CPI report to come out, the Consumer Price Index, which I think comes out at 8.30 Tuesday morning. So I think that's kind of what this bull flag is just doing is biding time. It's keeping a bullish uh, bias to it, but it's just biding time for that CPI report. Now, if the CPI report comes in hot, which would be the first in the last three or four, then that would kind of confirm what the market's been a little bit fearful about from payrolls and from uh, the services PMI. But if the CPI report does what the last three or four have done and it comes in, you know, soft, then I think this market's going to break out and it's going to rally some more. But in the meantime, it's just, I can go through a couple more charts like the Dow. Uh, actually, the Dow is doing nothing. Okay, so the Dow was the leader off of this October low. There's a little W base here. And from here to here, it was the leader. So I did a video, you know, the financial media saying, oh, the Dow is up 20%. It's a new bull market. And I'm like, nah, it's not a new bull market. You know, that 20% definition is really arbitrary. Because the 20% move in Tesla could just be like 
a minor dip, you know, it depends on the stock's beta. But I, I look at the primary trend. So it's been going sideways. Dow hasn't been doing anything. This is a big triangle. Uh, big triangles like this sometimes act more often than not as tops rather than bullish consolidation. So I don't have a lot of conviction on the Dow either way. My only conviction was, you know, back in like November, December, my conviction was that NASDAQ would start leading and the Dow would start lagging. And then we've pretty much seen that since then. The NASDAQ over here coming into the new year, oh, just kind of zoom these out, has been leading this whole thing, this whole rally into the new year. Um, let me check. Oh, J and D is Kirk. Okay. <laughs> Tony. Hi, Tony. Cool. Cool. So let me see what else I got here. I'm going to probably keep this stream like a little more freewheeling. So if you guys have questions, we'll get to those. But um, I know people want to talk about bull flags. Um, there's a lot of them, you know, so I showed you uh, S&P, the NASDAQ 100. Uh, we even have something like that in small caps you know, right over here. And the interesting thing about small caps is that um, when we were trying to break out over here, I kept saying there's a really strong zone of resistance between 189 and 190. So I put 189.50, kind of split it down the middle. And that went all the way back to um, basically, I think September of that. Yeah, September. Let me just kind of pull this back a little bit. Yeah, there it is way back here in September. So this was kind of a real big zone of resistance. So breaking out above it was important. But when you break out above a zone of resistance, you want to see it now act as, as support. So notice what, you know, IWM small caps are doing. They're just hanging out right in that little zone, uh, haven't broken down or anything, but they're sitting right there. Same th thing with the S&P 500, 4,100 was a huge level and it's just kind of sitting around that 4100 level there consolidating so okay let's see do you think we are in complacency stage of market set yeah i do okay unselected the unselected do you think we're in complacency stage of market psychology yeah 100 percent. so i'm not real big on you know the cnn fear and greed index is like you know, a strong indicator, but it's a good, broad, just kind of sentiment indicator. And it's been pegging up into greed and extreme greed coming down a little bit. I don't think it's quite at levels that are like red alert, uh, but you see it's definitely moving up. You see a lot of investors that didn't believe in this rally. I mean, we've been looking for this rally since really, um, before October. So let me see if I can get back a little bit. Yeah. So right over here is where we're looking for a base in uh, the Dow. Let me go do a, yeah, I'll stick with the 60 minute chart. Hopefully you can see it, but inverse head and shoulders here, the Dow had a, um, like a double bottom base right here, a W base. So there were a lot of bases and this is what we were looking for. So a lot of people really miss this being bearish. And, you know, if I look at the market and I, see what's going on with rates and the um, balance sheet coming down. I would think, yeah, this market should be bearish too, but we're actually following the price action um, and we've been able to catch this rally, but there's been big funds like um, Bridgewater, Ray Dalio's fund. I mean, it's one of the biggest hedge funds out there. And basically they missed this kind of counter trend rally and all the gains that they made in 22 in 2022 up to this point were wiped out having missed or having been on the wrong side of this. So I think a lot of investors feel underexposed and uh, not just past Thursday, the Thursday before that, you know, when we were hitting the measured moves, I was saying to a lot of my um, subscribers at Wolf on Wall Street that the market feels really frothy this morning, like kind of settled down a little bit with these uh, corrections or pullbacks we're in now. But yeah, I do agree with you on that. Um, Yeah, Adam, I agree with you. I think Tuesday morning is going to be a big thing. So again, we're just hanging out in these bull flags for right now. And um, there's a couple things that can happen. You know, first, let me address something that I've been talking about with the subscribers on the website. So when a bull flag starts, a lot of times it'll be very small. Like this is kind of how it started over here. 
and you get like a hint of what's going on. But a lot of times they will broaden out. So what I always do and what I recommend doing is rather than sticking with the trend lines you have and, and basing your analysis off that, you have to always like look at the chart with fresh eyes. So I'll take the trend lines off and let go of that bias of the trend lines that I have on there and see what, you know, where the trend lines are going to capture the most price action. So I do change these as price changes and morphs. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to be super objective. So if I'm a uh, short S and P 500, then, you know, I, I might draw a bull flag a little bit different and go, Oh my gosh, that could be, you know, a, um, a false breakout or a bull trap. So you just, you know, just very slight adjustments to these change the outlook, especially if it's over a longer period, they change the outlook a lot. You make a very slight adjustment. So it's okay to have your opinion and to be, um, you know, positioned in the market according to your opinion, but you really have to, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not being very, very objective with these trend lines. So I want to point out one thing just because I mentioned, um, false, false or um, head fake moves. We got one of those back here in the S and P. So I was thinking uh, back here about a week ago that we might be getting a kind of a bull trap and then, you know, price action uh, kind of filled in the gaps more and the trend lines were adjusted. So we didn't have that, but over here, I think the most dangerous time for these consolidations is right when they start to break out or start to break down. So we got a little dip right here. This looks, you know, as it's happening, it looks like that that bull flag is failing, right? So shorts will jump in here. Now, the reason we knew it wasn't failing or, or suspected it wasn't was high yield credit was acting better here. High yield credit was making a higher low. So it was leading. So the bears jump in on this breakdown and then all of a sudden they get squeezed and it's that whole concept of from failed moves, you get really fast reversals, but those can happen on the upside too. We could have like a breakout here and then it just fails and comes back down in and that's a bull trap. So those are the things you really want to watch out for early on in a breakout. I want to see breakouts really definitive. I mean, really move through that strongly, see volume pick up, volume should be falling off here and then picking up on the breakout. Um, let's see, Adam, do you think there's still a potential and some decent upside for the months ahead? Because as we know, when the yield curve is inverted, this could be a good time for stocks. It is only when it steepens equals bad. Yeah. So what he's kind of talking about is, um, I think that the yield curve inverting like the two and 10 spread or the feds favored three month and 10 year when, um, it inverts, that is pretty much the highest probability signal that you could have that we're going to have a recession. Um, but that's kind of like the first warning flag that goes up. Then after it inverts, it steepens sharply. And that's usually when you start to enter a recession, that kind of sharp steepening is usually because the Fed is cutting rates at that point. But um, I think the reason I think, and let me switch over to a different program. Actually, let me, let me queue it up first and then I'll switch over to a different program and I'll show you what I've been seeing. And this is what we were calling for too, towards the end of last year was a rotation away from the cyclical stocks that had really been leading the rally and to the mega cap stocks that were like the biggest stinkers last year that did the worst because it looked to me like the markets in this phase one of celebrating, um, basically peak inflation, peak Fed hawkishness. I think phase two is the market starts to come to grips and reality with the bill coming due for having fought inflation, which is a recession. So the market is really like right now, a lot of the retail they're jumping in, they're kind of buying into this soft landing narrative, which is like the Fed can kill inflation by hiking rates and uh, cutting their balance sheet, but we can just narrowly avoid a recession. That's a nice thought, but if you look at those yield curves I mentioned, and they're on the St. Louis Fed's website, the two and 10 and three month and 10 year, you'll see that they are about the strongest, you know, forecast of a recession. And they're the most inverted since the last time we had inflation back in like 1981, 1982. So just from a probabilities perspective, 
I think um, the market will start thinking about recession after this little um, rally ends, but I don't think we're quite at the end yet. And what I want to show you, I'm still queuing this up. I was talking too much. Okay, let's see. Let me scale it. So what I'm going to show you is just some equal weight indexes that I have that I've made. Let me queue them up. Go to Stock Finder. And this is Stock Finder. I love Stock Finder because it's got so much historical data. You can get like 5,000 bars of intraday data. So if you can see this, um, what you're looking at is the S&P 500 in the candlesticks. And the white line is just an, an see, it says list index. It's completely equal weighted. So it takes out all the weighting. So, you know, it's no like distortions from the mega caps or anything like that. And these will be the cyclical sectors like materials, energy, industrials, uh, financials. Technically, consumer discretionary is a cyclical sector, a very cyclical sector, but it moves with the mega cap heavy sectors, technology, and communication. So I keep that off to the side. So the point is, here's that October low. And um, there's kind of the inverse head and shoulders that was taking place in the nat in the S&P. And I know you're probably looking at this going, what? It's like looking at clouds. No, I see a rhinoceros. <laughs> but yeah, that's um, the inverse head and shoulders. And over here, look what the sec cyclical sectors do. They make a higher low right as the market is making its October low. So this is a positive divergence. It's just one of many things that we're seeing at the time. But these cyclical sectors really led this rally where the Dow gained 20%. And the Dow's kind of gone flat since then, right? So they really led the rally. They're still hanging in there, okay? And this is why market breadth right now is so strong is because all these sectors, they don't have a lot of weight like the mega caps do, but there's a lot of, of stocks in them. And uh, this is the reason that market breadth looks good because they're still participating. Let me show you um, my little mega cap index. And this is just mega cap stocks, but again, equally weighted. So there's no distortions. And what you'll see here, let me see if I can back out a little bit, is they pretty much kind of tracked with the market. They didn't lead it much over the course of uh, last year. You can see it mostly in here, but I'm going to zoom in closely to December because you remember in December, the S&P could not get above 4,100 and it pulled back. 4,100 was right here, tried it once, tried it twice, and then it came down like eight or 9%. But look at these mega caps, what they're doing. So they got hit so hard last year that towards the end of the year, everybody was just selling them, taking tax losses before year end. So you can see if I had um, a pointer, you know, less and less participation. So at this first shot of 4,100, already less participation. At the second shot, less participation. But now we come into January and they have really taken over the whole show over here. So I think personally that when hedge funds and everybody else rotates into a new sector like this that they've been ignoring or kind of dogged out the last year, I think it's likely they'll stay at least the rest of the month and probably the rest of the first quarter, so through March. Um, so I think they do have the potential to move the market still. And let me show you where the money is coming out of, because it's not coming out of cyclicals as much. And this is just an equal weight index of the defensive sectors. So those would include utilities, consumer staples, uh, healthcare, real estate's considered back too because it's a bond proxy. But you can see here, they were leading the rally fine. That first uh, rally from October to November where the Dow made 20%. But if you look over here, they're like starting to really lag, especially recently. So my thing is, I, I think the money is rotating out of these defensive sectors and into uh, the mega caps, which speaks to a question asked earlier, you know, are we in the complacency Phase. So what you're seeing here is investors becoming um, more willing to take on risk. They're starting to chase the higher return stocks that haven't performed well. So there is a shift 
in market psychology. And when everybody's on the same side of the boat, that's usually when they're wrong and, and the boat flips. So I don't think we're there yet, but I do think like what you said, I think it was Adam or the unselected. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we are getting frothy. So I'm going to take a look at these comments again here. Oh, sorry. I really got to get this live streaming thing set up a little bit better. This is only my second one. So hopefully you guys can bear with me. Um, yes, yeah, so I do think there is potential for more upside. And if we want to take a quick look at the S&P 500, I know a couple of people were asking about um, measured moves in um, both flags. So looking at the S&P 500, I usually go with a more conservative approach to uh, measured moves. So let's kind of just pull this out a little bit. By the way, the 4150 measured move for the S&P was completely based on the base that it put in back in October. And then when we get new flags and stuff along the way, we can kind of dial in that measured move target. So I would put your chart on log and uh, you can do it you know, the old way is to count points. So, you know, if the Dow moved 300 points in a move like this, you would basically add 300 points to the breakout point of um, this bull flag. I just used a log chart and I just measure it real quick. So right here, that's, this is the flagpole. Okay. That kind of vertical rally. And, you know, you could really start it down here, but I, I tend to take a little bit more of a conservative view and just look where the actual momentum really started. So if we measure that, you get about, I don't know, like 3.3%, something like that. Another way you can do it is just on a log chart is put this little trend line in here. Oh, it's probably gonna be a little sloppy, but that comes right up to the price, right? That's about right. So let's measure 3.3%. Like, let's assume this broke out on, um, Monday morning, you know, like broke out of the bear flag or the bull flag Monday morning. I didn't want to do that. I knew that was going to happen. Let me get this about there. Oh, come on, you pointer. Okay. Hopefully this works without me destroying this flag. So Anyway, let's say about 3.3%. That's right here around um, 4270. You can kind of do the same thing with this little guy. Put it here right at the breakout. And, you know, I didn't draw it perfect, but 4270. So, but you have to have it on a log scale. So you're looking at the percentage move. And I got to tell you, I have seen this for years and years and years. But every time I see a measured move hit, I'm just stunned. I mean, when the NASDAQ hit its measured move, let me get rid of some of this junk, at um, 12,785, I mean, the first time it hit it on that Thursday morning, it literally hit it like to the dollar. Then it moved up a little bit above and then came right back down, closed pretty much right at that measured move. So. It's amazing how well these measured moves work. But the thing you have to remember about, you know, we call it technical analysis and it is technical, but price action at its core is simply a reflection of mass human psychology. So these price patterns that were working and I've gone back and I've looked at the Dow from like 1916 and that's where all these price patterns came from. There were a lot more of them back then when central banks weren't like squeezing the volatility out of the market. But there's a reason that they've worked for over a century. If you look at Japanese candlesticks over many centuries, it's the reason is, is that price is a depiction of mass psychology or mass sentiment and human psychology. You know, the two things that drive price, fear and greed don't change. So this is the reason that when you see these, whether it's on a big daily chart or whether you're day trading on like a one minute chart, you see them, they work. They're, it's like fractal, they work. It's just a depiction of, of human psychology. So 
but still it, it's really amazing to see you know these measured moves hit like to the penny sometimes um i'm looking at the comments I don't want to miss anybody here, but I'm lagging you guys a little bit. Okay. The unselected. What percentage or prob of probability and overall weight in your analysis do you give the trend lines? If you have them drawn correctly and objectively, you know, because we do have, you know, a lot of subtle biases even when we think we don't, we think we're being really objective. You always have to check yourself. But when I see, let me put it this way. When I see so many bull flags, right? So the NASDAQ 100, the S&P 500, the Dow transports, the small caps. Um, you know, when I see so many of these, I give that a lot of weight. So my indicator 3C, people are always like, what is C? 3C stand for. So three C's. Compare, compare, compare. So for me, the more confirmation I get, the more of these kind of uh, bullish consolidations I'm seeing, the higher probability I put on it. So last week I was saying, you know, my, you know, to my subscribers that I'm at about 80%, 75 to 80% that we make an X leg higher. And that may not sound like a lot, but that is a lot. And it would move up even more if the kind of market signals that I watch, the market signals that I'm talking about, some of them are indicators, some of them are just how like semiconductors act against the tech sector. They almost always get weak right here at the start of a consolidation. And then towards the end of it, they start leading out of it. So that's the part I haven't seen yet. And I think that's just because of this whole CPI thing on Tuesday, uh, a few signs of those, but in any case, um, Another thing I want to do was go through S&P sectors and show you uh, what's going on there too. But let me just check these other comments. Brant, okay, Tony. Brant, do you have enough info on the consolidation to determine a possible measured move? Yeah, so I, I think NASDAQ has the most potential. So, you know, it's looking at probably, you know, that's almost almost 7%. I think it has the most potential because it's the one that's rotated in uh, with the start of the new year. And you'll see that when I go through the S&P sectors. Let me just check other ones. Wrong scene. Wrong scene. Somebody said wrong scene. Do I have the wrong scene up? Oh, jeez. Gosh, darn it. I am so sorry. I told you I'm getting... Ugh. Can't believe that. It looks like mission control on my computer here. All right, anyway, so bull flags again, real quick. So bull flags, NASDAQ, bull flags, S&P 500, bull flags, Dow 20, bull flags, IWM. Hopefully you guys are seeing this, okay. Um, and measured move, I think NASDAQ 100 has the most upside. So again, I was talking about measured move on a log chart. I just do it with this little pointer. And over here, you'll see the box. So the measured move here up to the top of that is about, I mean, we can call it, it, it depends on how aggressive you want to be with it. I tend to be a little bit more conservative. So where I see the strong momentum first start. So let's say 6.4%, you add that onto the breakout here for the NASDAQ 100. And just to recap real quick, what I was saying is you could also draw a trend line on the chart, on a log chart, and you can use that. So when we do get the breakout, you just put it wherever price actually started to break out. Okay. And that gives you your measured move right there. But that has to be on a log chart. So I'm really sorry. Oh my gosh, I feel horrible. But we will go through some other charts that... Um... Okay. Short AMD targeting 60. You can see the chart. Lost audio. I still have audio. Completely frozen. Does anybody hear me and have the charts right now? I know I have like a little lag. I'm a little ahead of you. Okay. 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 Gosh, I'm really so sorry, you guys. 
I had to, uh, when I first decided to do uh, a live stream on YouTube, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. I just hit go live, but it will only allow you to show your web camera. I can't share charts and everything. So I had to get a whole new studio program to be able to do that. So now I'm like watching charts, trying to run the studio program, trying to read comments, <laughs> trying to read my notes, trying to read your comments. I'll get better at it. I'm sorry. But if there's anything um, that you heard me saying that you couldn't see, that you would like to uh, see, let me know. But what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to run through the SP sectors. The question, you know, how do I feel about these uh, trend lines? Because there's so many vol flags that uh, it's just hard to ignore. But what I do want to show you is just we don't even need to like go real deep into it. Just keep your eye on the price action. You can see a, an uptrend here. Or you can see a bull flag. But I'm going to run through these sectors real quick, starting with um, materials. It's a cyclical, right? That one has a bear flag, right? So you can see the bear flag consolidation, and it's broken down. So remember what I said that I think money is more coming out of defensive sectors, but the cyclical sectors that led the rally um, from October to November are not leading as strong, like mega caps have taken up their mantle of leadership. They're still participating, but they're not looking as good. So materials right there, we're gonna to jump to another lightly weighted S&P sector, energy. It's kind of been all over the place. Um, it had like a little bullish kind of like a pennant here, broke out from that. It's just kind of following oil and the headlines of the day, but it's not a, a sector that has very much weight. So here's industrials. They look okay. You know, I think we could call this probably a modest bull flag. It's not great. And then let's look at some of the defensive sectors. So I'll start with consumer staples. Wow. Very different look, right? This is the same time frame. You have a big pair flag here, right? Here's utilities. This is another one that's defensive. Look what they're doing. I mean, same time frame as the other charts. This is trending down in healthcare. What is it doing? It's trending down on the exact same time frame. Here is tech again, technology. It's up and it's trading in some kind of consolidation here. It might be a bull flag. It might be probably just a rectangle at this point. But, um, you know, consumer discretionary up with a bull flag. Communications up with a bull flag. Then you go back to healthcare, same time frame, moving down. So that's what I was showing earlier um, about those equal weighted sectors kind of moving and uh, rotating. Okay, let's see. Is the 3C's measurement a proprietary quant? So 3C for me is just a, a money flow indicator. So um, I'm going to pull that up. And hopefully I'll switch the chart so you see it. <laughs> and um, here we go. I'm going to switch the charts in just a second. So we've got that pulled up transition. And you should be seeing it in a second. So what I noticed was in um, December... This is a five minute chart, which has been doing a pretty good job reflecting kind of like the sub intermediate trend, like kind of the rally off of October's low. This is that really, really dull two or three week range in December in the averages where everybody's just on vacation. So there was some slight improvement in 3C right over here. Um, since this rally into the new year, there's been pretty good confirmation. But you can see right here as we hit the measured move target at 41.50 for the S&P 500. Remember, we're looking at SPY. Um, you can see a non-confirmation. So this is typical, something you would see uh, right before you go into a bullish consolidation. But let me show you QQQ's chart because it had been like the dog of last year. And the mega caps were the dog of last year. They saw quite a bit of improvement into December over here. If I had a, a screen draw to a lot, I would kind of draw this upward trending line while the price range is flat and then just started. This is really heavy money flows going into it. But again, same thing. We hit the measured move right here and it doesn't confirm. 3C doesn't make a higher high. This is not a concern for me. 
this is exactly what I expect to see when uh, we move into a consolidation phase. And over here, you know, it got a little bit hairy towards the end of the week, but came back up. So I, I don't see anything on this chart right now that tells me anything other than we're in a consolidation phase. Um, but I'm not seeing, you know, the strong kind of buying that starts usually around the second half or right before the flag breaks out. I'm not seeing that uh, quite yet. I am seeing a couple things in like um, high yield credit is starting to show a little bit of improvement recently. So this is like a, a two minute chart. So over here you can see no confirmation high yield credit dumps. This is because over this period, this is a payrolls period. So yields have shot higher and the market has basically um, priced in like a little bit more aggressive Fed terminal rate. So high yield credit is one of my favorite indicators because institutional traders use it as a proxy for S&P futures. It's very, very deeply liquid. So sometimes um, you get a window into what institutional traders are doing when high yield credit diverges with the S&P. But when you see this kind of thing, you also have to be aware that high yield credit is very rate sensitive and you get a 20, 30 basis point move in rates up, uh, high yield credit is gonna come down. But over here, I'm starting to see what looks like some buying start to filter in. So ideally, what I would like to see, um, let me see what the best way to show you this is. Let me try, I don't know if I, without jumping into a whole nother program that I don't have set up, but let me just see if I can do it on TC2000. And then I'll switch the screen and share it with you guys. Okay. I am about ready to switch the screen. And it should be coming up for you in a second. So what I have here, just checking the comments again. So what I have here is the S&P 500 with um, the blue line is HYG. It's not normalized because HYG doesn't have the same beta as the S&P. But what we're looking at is the trend. So like in this August rain, or I'm sorry, this December, really, really dull holiday range, you can see um, high yield credit was actually leading the market lower into the end of the year. Then it starts improving like noticeably. So if you could see the S&P 500 is making equal lows here at 3,800. And that was one of the, the positive things back then was that it was holding 3,800. But you could see higher lows in high yield credit. So this is a leading divergence. This is a market signal for me. So when I see prices moving sideways in the index and high yield credit starting to lead higher, that's the kind of positive signal I'm talking about that I'm looking for in these bull flags. So very, very positive. As a matter of fact, if you look at where high yield credit was right here, the last time the S&P tested 4,100 twice and failed, and then you look at where high yield credit is over here, high yield credit was already saying in advance, the probabilities are that the S&P will break out above 4,100 when it gets there. So this was forecasting that three or four weeks ahead of time. So this is why it's really one of my favorite indicators. But if you look closer, you can see it hasn't been acting well. The reason it hasn't been acting well here is because of this huge jump in um, treasury yields. So let me get rid of that chart. And I'll just show you the treasury yields real quick. And that is really, you know, we had, this is the 10 year yield, by the way. So we had a bear flag in the 10 year yield. It started to break down right here as it should, right? Sorry, I'm getting a sip of water. And the very next day was that super strong payroll support and the strong services um, PMI that reversed yield. So this should have broken down. It was set to break down, bear flag. You can see a whole bunch of broke down here, here, a big one over here that kind of failed, but another one below it. And then that really strong data that sent yield soaring. So this kind of jump in yields is why High yield credit has come down so much uh, recently, but yields seem like they're starting to kind of like settle in, have priced in um, that strong data 
and are sitting here now and waiting for that CPI data on Thursday. But there's a lot of things I look for, you know, how semiconductors act um, versus tech. Let me take a look at the comments again. Okay, so uh, do you mainly stick with index or sector ETFs when trading? And do you use options? I, I do use options. So I prefer, well, let me just say this. You guys have quick like time for like a really quick story. <laughs> it's really quick, hopefully. So um, when I first got into the stock market in the late 90s, I, I started with fundamental analysis, like technical analysis really wasn't, I remember people calling it voodoo analysis and saying like, oh, how are a bunch of squiggly lines on a chart going to tell you anything about what a company's worth or what it's going to do? So I started with uh, fundamental analysis, you know, looking at cash flows and PEs and, you know, the balance sheet and all that stuff. And there was like this method where you could kind of grade a stock and I found one, this stock Troy Group. They were working on Bluetooth for Hewlett Packard at the time, and they got a 98. And you, you know, you watched IBD Investors Business Daily. I don't even know if they're still around. Their rankings and the stock ranked really high. I mean, it looked really good at the time, and I bought it. Didn't know anything about technical analysis. I can't remember what I bought it for, but let's say 45. Then a couple of weeks later, it's trading at 40, and you know, this is one of those <laughs> those things where you're like, oh, well, if it was a deal at 45, it's got to be an even bigger deal at 40. Let's buy more. <laughs> bad, bad way to go. Um, and then, you know, it's dropping more at 35. And I'm like, what the heck? Looking at the news, there's nothing going on with the company. I start looking at more stocks. I'm like, what? They All these stocks are going down around March of 2000. What is going on here? That's the first time I kind of really got into technical analysis and I looked at the chart and it's like, oh, wow, we're just entered a bear market. So what I'm saying is that I know some people like to trade individual stocks. I like to take as much uncertainty out of the picture as possible. Um, the number one most important thing, if you're going to trade an individual stock, the number one most important thing is that you understand what direction the market is most probably heading in because i would say like 90 percent of stocks whether you know they're great companies or horrible companies doesn't matter 90 percent of them are going to trend generally with the broader market the market averages like the sp 500 and then the next strongest influence on them is what sector they're in so like i ran through those um sectors right let's see that's materials not looking good with a bear flag another cyclical energy it's okay but it's not doing fantastic financials again not a lot happening you look at the defensive sectors trending down that's uh, healthcare, utilities right um there's consumer staples and then you look at something like tech which is in a bull flag or a bullish consolidation uh consumer discretionary uh, mega cap heavy sector, right? So this is why it's really important to know what sector you're in and how these sectors are performing. So at the start of the year, these mega cap sectors, the communications, the consumer discretionary tech, they rotated in. So if you have been like long a healthcare stock, you're not doing well right now because healthcare is getting killed. So first you want to know what the broader market's doing. Then you want to know what the sectors are doing and then pick a stock. So the stock picking should be like the last thing. Most people make it the first thing. Um, but I try to take as much uncertainty out. So when I deal with, um, you know, trading stuff, I'm more apt to trade the index, you know, or let's say SPY or one of the uh, ETFs, leveraged ETFs or sectors. So when you get down to the granular level, the stocks can move a lot more, of course, but then you have, you know, did the CEO just get fired? Did this happen? There's just a lot more uncertainty, earnings, all that stuff. So I like to try to take out as much uncertainty as possible, but you know, that doesn't mean that's the right way for everybody. You know, if you're like, uh, uh, you know, you work in AI, you know, you might be 
really qualified to pick the best AI stock, you know, so everybody has different strengths and weaknesses, but yeah, sometimes they use options, but generally speaking, <laughs> I always get killed with options, you know, I never go out long enough. It, it's just, I'd say, you know, a majority of the time, the people making money are on options are the ones who are selling them, they're writing them, not the guys who are buying them. But um, I'm going to look at the comments again here. Are you concerned much by the rise of bond yields lately in terms of this rally? Yeah, so the, the rise in bond yields, again, is just the market was thinking one thing, uh, that inflation has peaked, and then it got that big surprise on uh, Friday. What was it? The third. They got that big surprise in the payroll report, uh, which is a bunk report. I mean, it's politically goal-seeked. It's right now they're pretty much guessing, you know, majority of the report because they're not getting enough respondents. So they're modeling it. Um, but yeah, that's caused the, the rise of bond yields. I think they have now priced in uh, that stronger data. So I think they brought the Fed funds terminal rate up to 5.11%, which is, you know, it's made a big jump. So that's why bond yields have moved so much. I don't see them moving a whole lot more unless the CPI really surprises and it comes in hot and people start worrying about um, resurgent inflation. There's always going to be noise in the data, just like there's noise in a trend. You know, I mean, the trend here is up, but you do get, you know, dips. You do get corrections. It's the same with um, financial data or economic data. So um, you can get three or four weak CPIs, then one strong one. It doesn't mean that the inflationary trend is not rolling over, but the market is not going to react well to that. So, um, and like I said, that's really what's been killing like high yield credit. I mean, look at the comments again. Yeah, this could happen and change a lot on Tuesday with that CPI report. It's either kind of going to say, oh, yeah, there is something there. We've gotten like a bump in inflation or it's going to go the other way and just keep confirming what it has been, which is pretty much in my view that inflation started to roll over in June, which is really apparent in commodities. Um, the strong unemployment data may in part be due to the legal immigrants employed uh, without higher wages. That, look, that data report, our unemployment report has had so many quirks and so many, I really don't trust it at this point. But, you know, that's what the market has. And the market is going to react to it. Um Oh, okay. Yeah. Micro with Metro Media Fiber Networks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really had no idea as a, you know, somebody in the fundamental analysis at that time, how meaningful it, it's like the tide, you know, like a rising tide lifts all boats. It doesn't matter if you have a great stock or a crappy stock, like these mime stocks that all the young people are trading these days, a rising tide, a rising trend in the market averages pretty much lifts all boats. But conversely, if the tide's going out, then most boats are going to go out with it. So um, again, if you're into picking individual stocks, I, I am not saying that's wrong at all. It's not my play just because I don't have the time to do all the research into individual stocks. Um, but number one and number two, before you pick the stock should be, do I understand the highest probability of which way the market trend is going? And is the sector, what, what sectors are in favor? What sectors are out of favor? Like we just saw, you know, with uh, all those sectors I just ran through. Let's see, do you, uh, do you do your analysis in 15 minute time frames? Uh, it just depends, Frank. It just depends, you know, uh, what I'm kind of looking at. So. Let me go back to the S&P 500. I, I usually, though, don't use daily charts that much. I do look at daily charts, but they're not going to show you. A daily chart is not going to show you this bull flag like uh, an intraday chart, 15 minute or 30 minute. And it's not going to show you, you know, where price is respecting those trend lines, you know, over here, over here, over here, which is giving the trend lines, giving the chart more validity. But um it just depends. I might look at a five-minute chart, a two-minute chart. 
Um, but generally speaking, I look more at intraday charts than than daily ones. I do look at the daily chart, you know, kind of at the end of the day or to see where some important moving averages are just because technical traders, you know, trade around those. So um, Tony, CPI, Adobe Digital Inflation Index has shown a small increase in prices across indices, except flowers, natural gas. Yeah, natural gas has been killed. Natural gas. Let me just pull up UNG. It's kind of an ETF for natural gas, but I'm going to put this one on a daily chart and get rid of these moving averages. I mean, look at this. This is like, <laughs> this is a deflationary signal, you know, in natural gas. So let me widen this chart out a little bit. That's like what I was saying in June, right? We saw a lot with my, my copper gold ratio that I follow a lot for, um, inflation deflation started to say that inflation was rolling over around June. So you see a, a drop like this, you know, if we weren't in a normal, uh, well, it's not a normal time, but if we weren't in um, an inflationary period, you know, this was like we we're in a bull market and I started seeing, you know, natural gas doing this. I started seeing oil doing this. I started seeing wood and lumber doing this. These were the exact things I was seeing you know, five, six weeks before COVID hit the U.S. shores and before it tanked the stock market by like 35%, uh, all of them, bond yields, everything was moving down sharply. They were all screaming deflation, deflation, deflation while the stock market was at all-time new highs. So those assets were wrong. The stock market was right. But yeah, that's, you know, natural gas just getting hammered there. Let's see what about that is. 76 percent yeah definitely deflationary and primary selling options for the past three years yeah yeah it seems to me you know in my experience it's always you know the guys selling options that are are making the the most money snap next mime stock yep definitely let me see what else i have for you here i have a couple notes so we ran through the S&P sectors. Oh, let me show you uh, semiconductors real quick. So semiconductors, another um, bullish flag. I mean, look how cool this is too. Came out of a bullish ascending triangle. Um, broke out early, way before it came to an apex. So that's a strong move and a real strong bull flag over here. So if we look at kind of the measured move, you can just take it right from the breakout point. If you were to be really aggressive, you would take it from here. So you can give yourself kind of a range that would be 9.3%, but I tend to lean a little bit more conservative and then just adjust it as price action develops. But, you know, semis could add, you know, almost 7% on a breakout from here. They're acting well. If I show you the tech sector real quick, I'm gonna have to set this chart up, but... Um, what I'm going to do is put a comparison of the tech sector with semis because semis are what I call a, a leading um, asset. So they tend to lead the technology sector. They're more sensitive than technology and they tend to lead it. And let me see if I can get year to date. I don't want year to date on a daily though. So I'm going to do this by hand. So this is this chart is normalized. And there is about the third, let's see. There's about year to date. So this chart is normalized. So they both start at the same point. You can see semis are leading the technology sector this whole year. So this is a leading signal, but I would also look at this on a short-term time frame. So if we're looking at you know these consolidations over the last week or so, you can see semis um, right here. You can see them leading higher right here. So higher lows, higher highs, and kind of just going into consolidation over here and they're leading a little bit lower right here. So these are some of like those market signals I was talking about that I'm looking for, whether it be high yield credit or like how semis are performing against tech. So if semis started to lead tech over here, I'd say, okay, I think we're getting close to these bull flags breaking out. Um, same thing with high yield credit. There's uh, transports tend to lead the Dow industrials. Um, small caps, IWM tend to, re to lead risk sentiment. So there's a lot that you can actually use. High yield credit, again, is just HYG. It's one of my favorites. Um, but 
Not sure where I was going with that. I'm going to check the comments again. Probability wise, do I expect market will go? Yeah, probability wise, yes. So that that's all we can ever establish in the market is probabilities. No, you know, people want to be gurus and tell you, oh, the market's definitely going to do this. It's definitely going to do that. So what I what I do for my subscribers, and I hope some of you on there will back me up on this, is I show you all this stuff. I give you my reasons why, and um, when I see this many bull flags, you know, I'm like, yeah, the probabilities are that the market, not just Dow 30, Dow 20. Oh, gosh. All thumbs. Dow 20, small caps, SP 500. When I see all these, and I'm also seeing the sectors that have been leading, like technology acting well, um, consumer discretionary. Yes, so probabilities, you know, in my estimation right now, are probably like 75% that it moves higher. Now, if we get those leading signals, which I don't think we'll get before Tuesday, you know, but if we do, then that would increase the probabilities. Or if those leading signals deteriorate, then it would reduce the probabilities. But I'm always looking at the market from a probability standpoint. If probabilities are high, that's when I want to get involved. If the probabilities are low, like in December when we're just chopping around in a range, I don't want to be involved. You know, I don't want to put money at risk where I don't see a strong um, probability or a strong edge. Okay, so what else did I have for you? Oh, let me pull one other thing up. I'm going to show you um, how... The yield curve, the 530 yield curve is acting relative to the banks. Because this is another thing that I pay attention to and, and I think can be very useful. It's one of the things that um, I cited back in December to say that, hey, I think we're going to actually break out of this range to the upside. December was like a horribly slow month. Um, I'm going to transition and hopefully you'll see Stock Finder pop up in a second. And what I'm seeing here is uh, this is the KBW Bank Index in the candlesticks. And this white line is the 530 yield, yield curve. So steepening, what I was saying back here in December when everything was just going sideways and I saw the yield curve steepening and leading the banks, right? The banks tend to be most sensitive to it because if you think about it, um, you know, some, a lot of their money is net interest income. So when, uh, well, let me say this a different way. They borrow at short-term rates and then they lend at long-term rates. So when you have a yield curve steepening, their net interest income looks better. When you have it flattening, they're paying more for the short-term rate and they're getting less for the long-term rate. So when I saw this, I said, I think this is really bullish for the banks. I think the banks are going to break out. They're going to head up higher. But I don't think that the banks are going to do that without the broader market. So I think this is a bullish signal for the broader market as well. And you can see it did lead, but it also led right into this consolidation that we've been in. And, you know, this to me is not like a horrible chart. It's not like, okay, you know, everything's falling apart. But it's something you want to keep an eye on. Let me see if I can go out a little bit longer on this. You know, we've had, we've had worse signals than that. But... Um, yeah, this yield curve tends to lead the banks. And when you see strong signals like we saw in December, it's really hard to ignore those and think that they're not going to be a part of how the broader market acts. I keep hitting the wrong time frame. You know, leading banks up here, kind of leading banks are down here. So banks wouldn't be, um, if, I'm, if I'm trading over the next month or two, banks wouldn't be my first choice because they've got this downside pressure of the yield curve kind of pulling them lower. And as we already saw, you know, the cyclical sectors aren't doing, I mean, flip back to a uh, stock finder, or I'm sorry, um, TC2000. So the cyclical sectors, you know, aren't doing as well, like materials there with a bear flag, uh, energies kind of just a little bit all over the place. Uh, financials, you know, not bad, but it doesn't look like, tech. It doesn't look like consumer discretionary with a bull flag. It doesn't look like communications with a bull flag. It doesn't look like semiconductors with a bull flag. So, you know, to answer an earlier question, 
when I see, um, let me flip back to uh, the last chart we were looking at. When I see something like the yield curve that is kind of leading banks lower, and I already know that the uh, cyclical sectors are starting to fade out after having really led the rally from October, these wouldn't be my first choice to, I, I wouldn't necessarily short them, but I'd rather be long the stocks that are moving or like an index like MGK or something for the mega caps. Let me just take a look at the comments again. Do I have any stock? I, I try not to make st stock recommendations. I, I try. Uh, okay. So here's what I found. I've been doing this a long time, uh, especially with the website. What I found was um, I could give the same exact trade to 10 people who are subscribing and following, right? And I could walk them through every day exactly what I was doing. And at the end of the period, there would be 10 completely different results from people making money to people making or about the same I made or lost the same I made to people uh, either doing much better, or much worse, but they all had the exact same information. The thing is like with a lot of these like stock gurus and stock picking services, they have a system that works for them. You have to find a system that works for you. So if somebody says to you, Hey, XYZ stock is going to do great. It's going to go up, blah, 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 blah. If they might be looking at it, I have this friend, Arthur, who's been with me for a long time. And I would used to see stuff that I was like, hey, this chart looks really good. I, I think it's going to move. And it's in a message. And, um, you know, I, I'm looking at over like a one, two week period. And like an hour later, thanks, buddy. That was a great trade. I'm like, uh, yeah, we weren't <laughs> on the same page. But people have different... Um, risk tolerances, they have different time allocations, they have different methods. So you really have to find um, a strategy that works for you. And I think journaling is a really, really good, helpful way to do that. Um, what I would do, you know, when I did this a lot, it's like that old saying, show me a trader who keeps good records, and I'll show you a profitable trader. I would write down as much as I can in my journal about what stock I entered or, or index or whatever, why, how I was feeling, was I having a crappy day, was I having a good day, was I like super bullish, was I nervous, but everything I could put down and then I would leave it alone and move forward to the next one. And about three months after, you know, I would write that entry, I would go back and I would read all the entries and what you would start to see is patterns. You'd start to see wow, I really do good with swing trades, but I always get killed on day trades or I do good when I'm trading options or I, or, or I do good when I'm trading ETFs, but I always get killed on options. Um, you see these patterns and then you can kind of uh, just kind of work to optimize the things you're strong at and then either negate or don't do the things you're not good at or put some effort into fixing those. But we all have our own individual um, trading style and you really have to discover it. So like when I see these guru services that are saying, oh, you know, I made $5 million, they're not telling you about the 90% of the people that lost money, you know, and it's not because they, I, I'm not dissing the guru services. I'm just saying to treat every person as the same with trade ideas or um, it, it's just, it doesn't work. I've seen this, I've done it, it doesn't work. But I do like the market averages still. So I'm still bullish on those. I'm going to transition um, back to uh, Telechart or, or um, TC2000. I just got to fit it to the screen. Okay. Let me see if there's any. Uh, yeah, thanks, IP man. Just reading the comments here, guys. Uh, the platform that I was using to show uh, the yield curve in the bank index is StockFinder. I'll pull that up again for you real quick. The reason I love StockFinder is that, um, hopefully you can see it, that I can get 5,000 bars of intraday data 
And that means a lot to me when I'm really trying to track trends over um, intraday charts. And that's the thing I hate the most about Thinkorswim is that I can't get more than a couple days on, on a single time frame. Um, having system key. Okay, yeah. Let me see if I have anything else for you guys. Um, equal weight stock sectors. Yeah, I showed you those. The market, yeah, right now is just, it has been kind of rallying on this pivot notion or like the Fed step down. You know, the market's kind of been front running the Fed, but now it's starting to turn into more of the psychology of a soft landing that, you know, the Fed can raise rates, you know, by 500 basis points and drain its balance sheet by whatever a trillion dollars. And um, that that's going to have no effect on uh, the economy and we'll have a soft landing. So all those things can happen and we will not go into a recession. I think that is, I mean, this is just not my opinion. I think that's just a foolish idea. It's based on objective data, which is just about any of the yield curves you look at and how, um, how high of a probability it is that when they invert, <laughs> that you're going to have a recession. So I think we're going to have a recession probably the second half of the year. So I've been telling, you know, my members that I think there's three phases. Phase one is this kind of bullish phase that we're going through, um, which is the market sniffing out peak inflation. Actually, I can show you that on my um, gold shoe. The copper gold ratio. Okay, so don't worry about the, the sign up there. This is uh, my copper gold ratio in red, right? And the 10 year yield in blue. So I think it was like maybe March of 2021 when the Fed was still saying that inflation, they expect it to be transient. You know, once a vaccine's widely distributed, we won't have inflation. So what I saw at the time was the copper gold ratio exploding higher. And I think the 10 year yield was trading around 1.5 percent and i remember back here in like march of, of 20 what was it 2021 yeah i remember saying to my subscribers i showed them this chart i'm like this says that 10 year yield should be you know two three maybe almost four times higher than it was when it's trading at 1.5 percent you know and it's since gone up here over uh 4.2 percent but basically you know the fed has all these academics and all these programs, but they can't just see, you know, a simple thing like this that's been very, very reliable. Um, and then here's the 10 year yield. So this was, in my opinion, if you do drew a trend line right here, this breakdown right there was peak inflation around June of 2022, as you can see. Um, yields to me are still, you know, they're not, they're not too high relative to this kind of uh, bounce. But if we see this red line come down a lot more and yields are real high here, then I would say, you know, I would be getting ready to look for a big move down in yields. But it took, you know, a good year for yields to catch up to, to what this copper gold ratio was saying, which was inflation, like screaming inflation. Okay, let's, uh, let's see what else. Everybody still there? Lots of golden crosses. 10 year yield was cup and handle pattern that played out. Yeah, I didn't see that one. You'll have to send me that, Tony. Okay, so basically, we're going to go into next week. And I think the main event next week is going to definitely be uh, the CPI. And that's out, I think, at 8.30 on Tuesday morning. I don't expect that we're going to see much movement uh, out of these kind of bull flags before then. And if the CPI data comes in like at consensus or a little bit softer, I think the market will rally. If it is like unusually high, then I think we're going to have some trouble. But right now, what the market is telling me through all these bull flags is it was time to take a break anyway because we hit the measured move targets. And while we're taking a break, we might as well, you know, not put a lot of money in, a lot of conviction in before the CPI report. So that's what I'm seeing. 
this is just a normal bullish consolidation. It took out, worked off all the really sharp overbought um, indications that we were seeing back here. And it's shaked out some weak hands. I haven't seen the shorts really jump in to a high degree, but they did start coming in a little bit towards the end of this week. Um, the more shorts, I think, you know, kind of jump in and start taking that, that most shorted index down, the uh, higher probability is that we get a short squeeze and it really propels a move higher. But um, yeah, definitely CPI is the main event, you know, early next week to be watching for. So if that's it, I think I'm going to cut this off to you guys and not have this be a two hour one like before. But if you do have uh, questions or comments, um, I'll put in the description of this video, which will be available later once uh, YouTube kind of processes it and you can watch it live again. But I'll put description to my email and stuff. And if you have any questions, feel more than uh, free to, you know, send them to me uh, either through email or on the comments on when this video goes live on um, replay. Be more than happy to try to um, answer those for you. Okay, everybody, I hope you have a really fantastic weekend. Before you go, I'm going to see if my little neat little intro turns uh, heads here or not. So here we go. <laughs>So thank you, everybody, for joining me. I'm looking forward to the next one, too. Thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend.